Let's try to remix that a little bit. What's happened to everybody? <laughs> Hope everybody's having a fantastic Saturday. If you're watching this on Saturday, chances are your Saturday nugget as well as you had hoped. So if you see me blinking and rubbing my eyes and doing all that kind of good stuff, it's a uh, simple reaction to some sunscreen that I had worn. If you look at my eyes, they are freaking bloodshot. This stuff is pretty potent. Anyway, I got some in my eyes and I'm still trying to wash all of that out. So a uh, topic might be a little bit short. You know, the, the show might be a little bit short because of that, because this stuff is driving me crazy. Look at that. Some heavy duty uh, sunscreen there. So uh, yeah, I got the kind you can like wear swimming and all of that. I was at a Mopar Fest. So you know, being bald, there's a certain protocol that you have to work with. And well, sunscreen's part of that. And apparently I got myself or my hands on some pretty good stuff and it's still working even after trying to wash it off and scrub it off and all of that. So if you see me kind of doing something weird with my eyeballs. That's why that's why that is happening. Sambo is first day and saying, how's it going? Mr. Mason's going well. So the topic to get us kicked off tonight Kind of walks in lockstep with some of uh, some of the conversations, just some topics that have been coming up lately. And one of them uh, has to do with working with a tuner. You know, how to go about working with a tuner, some pitfalls that you can find yourself in. This AC kicking over here. Pitfalls that you can find yourself in when working with a tuner. And uh, just basically some how-tos and to try to get a bit of an understanding for how that shop is actually working. So um, I got some notes here. So kind of walking in lockstep with my eyeballs being jacked up right now. Uh, this will just give me something to look down on. So just kind of hang out here. But um, issues working with a tuner or whatever. Uh, a few things to remember. Number one, tuning shop is not a diagnostic shop. One of the biggest pitfalls people fall into is, well, if my car is doing something, my tuner can figure it out. That's not necessarily the case. In fact, that might be the last shot that you want to take to try to diagnose the problems of your car. Even if that tuner did tune your car or if another tuner got a hold of it, having all kinds of problems with it, you bring it to a new tuning shop, expect to pay significantly more. You're not just paying for the tune, you're also paying for the fix. And that diagnostics, that fix, gets pricey really quick. Performance shops have a higher labor rate for some pretty good reasons. Number one, it's specialized work. And number two, it's a specialized type of tech that you're working with. These guys typically have significantly more experience. They have significantly more specialized experience. And so what they're working on is, well, specialized. It's exactly the guy you want working on your car, but the gene pool for uh, that, or the depth, I should say, for that pond and the gene pool for the guys that will do that kind of work is pretty shallow. Expect to pay money and you don't want to be spending specialty shop labor rates to diagnose something that could be wrong with your car, which is in many cases, and I would say probably eight and a half to nine times out of 10, it's a mechanical issue. You'd hook up the smoke tester and find a vacuum leak. It's an exhaust leak. Typically with long tube headers, that's the problem, causing issues with short-term fuel trims, fuel pumps acting up, and all kinds of other issues that come in line. Unless it's directly related to the performance part or to the tune itself, it is going to be a pain in the ass for a tuning shop to actually break everything down and diagnose it especially when you have full builds that are going on right behind your car. See, that's another thing. There's no money in diagnostics unless you are being told flat out and you are willing to pay the $150 to $200 per hour that a, a shop may charge you just for diagnosing your car. That's a real thing. So just know that coming into it. Um. The other thing is this, I mean, I understand the reason for taking your car to a tuner to see it, you know, to a specialty performance shop to try to narrow down these problems. But you got to remember something. 
again, that, that is not the tuner's forte. That is not what the tuner is there to do. The tuner is there to tune a performance car to perform at its best, not to try to figure out what is wrong with a car. It, typically, if something goes wrong with a tune, there are drastic or very easily diagnosable uh, symptoms of that. You know, crazy short-term fuel trim uh, problems, lots of knock retard, which would yield to or fuel quality issues or a bad va exhaust leak, things of that nature. So just know that coming into that conversation. And the other side is this, a tuner's mentality. A lot of these guys are very much MDE related. They're, they're uh, mechanical design and engineering minded. So not only are they going to go in and try to sometimes find the problem if you talk them into diagnosing the car's issue, they're going to go in and really dissect the issue. And by the time it's all said and done, especially if you're taking your car to a new shop after another shop has pissed you off in the process of working on your car, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're spending a lot of money. I highly suggest that if you have a car that has been tuned by another shop, that you then don't take it to another shop to get fixed. Take it to the shop that did the work. Don't take it to another tuning shop with some sob crybaby story about how somebody done somebody wrong over here and expect that tuning shop to try to take pity on you. And quite the opposite. You're now going to have to pay tuning shop labor hours for a diagnosis that should be done by the shop that was originally working on your car. So, you know, trying to that whole let's make a deal thing, like if you just work with me on this, I'll, you know, we'll do this, that or whatever. Any higher end tuning shop worth their salt, not really going to want to have a whole lot to do with you on that because they've probably got two to three weeks worth of backlog sitting in front of you. It's just a real bad look. So moving forward with that, a lot of guys think that the build itself is something that the shops start getting excited about. It's not. A shop doing whatever build you're doing, just pick one out of the clear blue sky, they've done it a lot of times before. And that's the reason probably why you're going to them with this build. But regaling the guys in the back about what you used to do back in the day when you were a kid and you knew everything and you could do this yourself, but you just don't have the time and or the tools or whatever. It's like, no, you, you couldn't, you wouldn't. And believe me, you don't want to be doing this work anyway. This is not their hobby. This is how they earn their living. This is how they pay their bills. So standing there talking to some dude is burning hours. And you can say, well, it's building the relationship. And the only relationship you need to know is that you got money and the shop has a skill set that you need. And that's it. A reputable shop will love to talk to you after the fact, love to support you after the fact. But leading into this, leave it up to the experts. Micromanaging and being all up in somebody's shit is a real easy way to get that car punted. And I know shops, myself included, um, that have punted cars for buyers being a little bit overly micromanaging. It's one of the things that uh, people that own their own businesses or are very entrepreneurial minded don't really take too kindly to. Um, another thing that's funny about about working at a tuner shop or, or you know, just, you know, how to work with a tuner in general is, and, and one of the things especially that you have to understand is that a lot of guys think that once they get their car tuned, that now they have this really odd relationship with this human being, okay? And what I mean by that is, or let me explain that. I have had calls 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, 9 o'clock at night, Sunday, Saturday, all hours of the night. Somebody hitting me up with a message or a phone call about something that their car is doing. And I've been woken up out of a sleep to this kind of a message. 
boundaries, people. You, you don't understand. Like, you don't... <laughs> Would, would you call your boss at those hours? Uh, would you call the company that built your blower or put your exhaust together? Or would you call the company that, I don't know, that you got your gasoline from if your data logs are showing like a potential fuel quality issue? Yeah, probably not. But interesting how the tuner guy gets the phone call or the tech at interesting hour in the morning. Hey, I need your help. This has gone wrong. Oh my God, I think it's blown up. Okay. Don't care. Race car problems, man. Cars blow up all the time. And it's not the tune's fault. Um, <laughs> there are hard parts that fail too. So I guess the way you have to look at it is understand the game that you're playing and also understand that these people they're not at your beck and call hit them up during business hours be polite they'll typically take pretty good care of you but I have had, I've had this conversation with folks and it's well what can you do what can I do I don't know but you google the name of about two or three record companies and have them drag the car over here you know they, these are the types of conversations that I've had you know, I'll take a look at it in a couple of weeks when we get around to it. Um, just know that these folks are doing their best. They, yeah, it's a dream job but it, it, for a lot of people. But for the folks that are doing it, they've gotten good at it. And, and there's a phrase. It basically goes like this. Be careful what you become good at. You may end up doing it for the rest of your life. And one of the problems there is be careful what you become good at. You may end up doing it for the rest of your life, meaning you may end up becoming sick of it after a while. And a lot of these guys kind of fall into a rut more than find themselves a niche, and they end up getting really good at something only to have to do it over and over and over again. So, you know, what may start out as your passion, you know, what you're all excited about is something that somebody else has probably been bored and sick of long before you ever discovered it. So um, just know that this is somebody's job. And um, even though you're out there living the lifestyle, doesn't mean that everybody else is. Um, so there's that. The other thing about it is people say, ah, oh, these guys just really aren't into it anymore. They're apathetic and all of that. No, all of us are into it. I mean, all of us enjoy it. In fact, today at Mopar Fest, I wasn't competing with my car, and believe me when I tell you, I would have owned the 1050 class. That would have damn near been a foregone conclusion. Um, <laughs> I should have run, man. God, I should have run. Um, anyway, no, you, people say, oh, they're just not into it. They don't support Some tuners don't support it or whatever. No, we're totally into it like very much so into it, far more into it than you might give credit for. Um, in fact, probably into it for more than you are. These are guys that have, uh, that are deeply invested, okay? They've got tools, they've got shops in some cases, the time that they've spent uh, gaining this expertise, the expense that they've had to go through during the R&D process, it's unbelievable. And the funny thing about it is, yeah, totally into it, so much more so than the people that are getting the car worked on that are excited for it. There's a difference between being excited about being into something and having been living that lifestyle for years, decades in some cases. So yeah, still totally into it. Don't mistake apathy for not being into something. It's just you know, or bore, don't be, I should have said, don't mistake boredom for apathy. I should have put it that way. Um, you know, the, the funny thing about it too is, you know, when you have people come in and, and they, they seem to tell you that they know more than you do. And, and it's, uh, th this conversation's come up where, well, so-and-so has done this and so-and-so has done that. Okay, 
well, meaning other tuners have been able to do whatever task that it is that maybe somebody's given you advice as to what you ought not to do. And then, oh, so-and-so has done it, and so-and-so has done it, and, you know, the reputable shop guy is going, yeah, but I understand that they've done it, but there's a lot of headaches along the way, and you try to explain this, well, I, I want it done that way. So let me get this straight. I have been invested in something for decades. I have far more investment in this lifestyle than this person has. I have far more experience and far more expertise, but some two-bit schmuck with an internet connection and access to a forum can look at a best case scenario that somebody did that maybe even ripped off a tune, by the way, and without knowing the downside, will then tell you how you're not doing as good of a job as somebody else. That's always a fun one. So if you're talking to somebody that speaks fluent, whatever car you're working with, Dodge, Toyota, Chevy, Ford, Mazda, it doesn't matter. If they speak that language and they're working in a specialty shop, they know the tricks, they know the pitfalls to stay out of. Let them do their job and give them enough time to get it done. Speaking of time, if you're taking your car to a shop, expect it to be in that shop for two months minimum. I don't even know how else to put it. One of the issues that we will have or that I have had working at different shops has been People bring something in and they want it done now. Like they get that whole Baruch assault mentality. I want it now, you know, and all this. Stuff. It's like, okay, if you want it done now, your $2,500 job is going to cost $500. For me to push everybody aside and get you up front, this is what you need to pay. Oh, balderdash, that's far too much. You want it done now? Like right now? Because everybody else in here wants their stuff done right now. And you have to have that conversation with somebody. The ball's on some people to have to have this conversation or this next conversation absolutely blow my mind. The next one is the Monty Hall. Let's make a deal. Well, if I do it, can we do it for, give him a product note, $2,500. Well, can you do it for $1,500? I got 1500 cash. Really? That's adorable. I spent twice that at the tool truck yesterday. You know, the price is 2500. Well, I can't get a discount. A discount. Really? So all my years of expertise are worth less to you than they are to other people that bring their cars here that don't bicker with me, that don't try to drive a price down. Do not find yourself in a position when you're trying to cheapen the work and the services and the expertise of the techs and the tuners that you're working with. The price is the price because, like I was saying earlier, tools are expensive, rent's expensive, it's a specialty shop. I'm sitting somebody working on somebody's 97 Lumina these are specialty shops working on very expensive builds with a boatload of liability tied to them. It's a lot more risk to reward when you're working within a performance shop atmosphere than you are when you're working at some slaughterhouse shop that's going to work on, you know, Nana's, you know, bingo bomber, you know, you know, Papa's Cadillac and, and you know, your shitbox pickup truck. That stuff is, is C-spot run, and all you have to do is replace stock parts. They don't break unless they wear out. Performance is a completely different ball game, and yeah, it's kind of cool when the car is done, especially when it's a package that all of the R&D had already been done on, but it can get wildly frustrating throughout the process, and... Not every build goes to plan, even when it is a build that you've done over and over again, because, well, let's go through the list. 
Aftermarket parts manufacturers send you the wrong shit. Aftermarket parts fail a lot more common than you think. A lot more often than you think. Okay, so for instance, okay, drive shaft manufacturer, a major one, sending the wrong drive shaft not once, not twice, not three times, but four different times for the same truck. <sighs> Try explaining that. Um, parts coming in damaged, um, axles have been that way. Um, just to right off the top of my head, electrical connectors, things like that that you need. Uh, fuel systems coming in defective. Had one fuel system come in with a chunk of plastic in one of the fuel lines. Like you try to, you know, we always blow everything out before you install it, right? This is a chunk of plastic that was wedged down in the line. And it was a, it was a shape of like a, like a lady's shoe, like a, like a, like a, like a triangle with a, like a little boat tail at the back. It, it looked like a lady's shoe. Fuel would go through it, and then at high flow demands, it would just, it wouldn't flow through. Anyway, that happened. Um, it caused two weeks worth of a backup, two weeks worth of a headache. I, I can go on and on, but parts fail. Guys get sick. Guys go on vacation. All of this stuff happens, and when you're also dealing with a, a, a business model that needs to work, it literally works on rotation with cars coming in and going out, coming in, going out. Any hiccup with that disrupts the timeline for the techs. That disrupts cash flow. That means that your diagnostic or your whatever issue that you have is now holding up everybody behind you. You're not that important. Don't bother the tech with some stupid story. Don't bother the tuner with some nonsense. Bring the car in, be truthful, be honest, and be real with what you want. Do some homework yourself. If what the tuner doesn't, if the tuner says something that you don't like, research what the tuner is saying. There's a reason why this expert in the field and the reason why you're bringing your car to them is telling you something that you don't want to hear. It's because their experience has taught them that whatever it is that you're asking them to do results in an outcome that sucks for everybody involved. Listen to the expert. That's what you're paying them this big money for. And again, it's going to be big money. The other thing, and it's just a bad look, for a lot of these tuner shops, they're working with late model cars. If you've got the kind of money to buy one of these late model Mustangs, Camaros, Mopars, could be any of them, ZL1, GT500, Hellcat, Red Eye, Demon, whatever, start picking them all, doesn't matter. If you've got the kind of money for that, Viper, looking at you, Viper guy. If you've got the vet, if you've got the kind of money for one of those things, again, don't come in trying to ask for let's make a deal type shit because that kind of bickering back and forth sets the stage for somebody to, you're going to suffer somewhere. It's going to be the... The, the person that you're asking for the whole let's make a deal thing, you immediately go to the bottom if anybody brings their car in and needs something done right now that's a good long-term paying customer. Yeah, your project gets punted first and it's the last to get picked up. Because again, time is money. And if somebody's paying more per hour or somebody's going to make life easier, which means the job goes more smoothly, which means it takes less time, time's money. And the lack of time for a paid job means you've picked up profit margin, which you need to buy tools, pay rent, keep the lights on, buy machinery, buy computers, buy everything that you need to buy for one of these shops. Just had a computer die on me today at Mopar Fest. This piece of dog crap Lenovo overheated. I'm never buying another Lenovo, by the way. 
Um, anyway, this thing overheated and wouldn't kick back on for another two hours. So anyway, keep that in the back of your mind when you're thinking about having these conversations. And here's the other thing. If you don't have a reputable tuner somewhere that lives around you that's convenient and you've got to send your car to somebody, when you send your car to somebody, because you will and you will need to do this, <clears throat> that shop, if it's anything like the shops I've been associated with, really do treat those cars like royalty. They, they, they baby them. They, they pamper them. They, you know, they'll get, we would wash them and detail the whole bit. That's how much respect we have for the customers and the customers' cars. We understand the investment that they have in these things. Um, yeah, they'll run hard on the dyno. They'll have some street validation hits, things like that. But the idea is that you have the right people working on your car. If you think that you're saving money because you've got a, a let's say a, a transport fee of like a thousand dollars to get your car to that, to that tuner, just remember that it's going to cost a hell of a lot more than that thousand dollars. If <laughs> the place that you take it to blows it up and doesn't want to stand behind their work, which is a lot of folks. So, Hey, Dad's Garage, thank you very much. I appreciate the contribution to the cause. Paid for the Dairy Queen on the ride back from the uh, from the Mopar Fest today. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Let's see. But anyway, let me get to you guys. Got a few more notes here, but... Well, I can go ahead and wrap it up on this. Uh, again, we're talking about time frames. It can take some time. Uh, you don't want a quickie job. Trust me on this. I mean, there, there's some jobs that just simply don't take a lot of time, but you don't want a you don't want a slap together or a, uh, a a thrown together a thrown together job. And the last thing, and this may or may not be the biggest takeaway with this. Every single one of these cars is different. I know that they're identical components. But believe me when I tell you, after being around these things, working with the tunes on these cars, working within the same operating system, multiple operating systems for the same car, I can tell you that they are all a little bit different, especially the Mopars. The Mopars always seem to be a little bit of a... Uh, special case and uh a perfect example of that is uh my car versus uh, uh versus jimmy's car the, i think our cars were literally a month different in age mine was maybe a month older than his car running line changes his operating system is slightly different than mine so really goofy changes that can take place everyone's a little bit different and not everyone's the same. You have a thing called tolerance stacking, and uh, it's a mechanical engineering term where you have everything is measurement. Okay, everything has a measure. And if your deck height has a measurement of, let's say it's eight and a half inches plus or minus two thousands, okay, your cylinder head has a height as one of many, many measurements of eight inches plus or minus two thousands um your piston has a height above the pin of two inches plus or minus two thousands so you have a deck to head to and a piston of two thousands just using some numbers that you might be able to kind of get in your head your rod has a length of six and a half inches plus or minus two thousands there's eight thousands. The throw of the crankshaft has a tolerance of four inches plus or minus two thousands. There's another uh, that's a full uh, tenth, ten thousands. So now 
you've got all of these tolerances that have stacked up in one way or another the car could literally have a little bit more or a little bit less compression and it, you might say well each measurement is insignificant but that's where you get the factory freaks if you will it's because of high tolerance stacking so anyway everyone's a little bit different and <laughs> I can tell you they're they all end up acting differently that's why there, there's no such thing as a cookie cutter tune the cars that I've tuned pretty basic stuff and it, even even cars with the same tune don't have the exact same tune so same basic value but none of them end up being the exact same <laughs> Mike saying uh, even uh, from not as smoky but now slightly chilly Washington I like it I was wondering if I do an MDS elite on my 5.7 should I still stick 5w20 um man I mean up there yeah I'd still stick with 5w20 5w30 would be fine up there too though uh, keep an eye on your oil pressures but you should be fine uh, for shaking saying, what's up, B? Uh, what's your take on tuners that lock their tunes? I totally understand it. Um, some tuners do lock their tunes because they don't want their tunes to get lifted. Part of the problem with tunes is that they are not hardware, like headers. I mean, if somebody steals your headers, that's a problem. Uh, but a tune is software, and people at one point back in the day would trade tunes back and forth and you know, when you put that, that kind of work into a tune, r and ding the tune and fine tuning and doing all this stuff and people just take it and, oh yeah, here's a tune for you. We'll just copy and paste that tune onto your car. Okay, well you can't really copy paste and tune an intake manifold or, you know, a throttle body or a blower or anything like that. But, you know, people don't have a problem copy paste and tunes. Um, you know, one instance where I found out that a guy had done that, I just asked him, you know, while his car was at the shop, he had apparently given a tune to a friend of his. And I said, well, while you're at it, we're going to go ahead and remove the supercharger, remove your fuel system. We're just going to give your buddy all that shit, too. What's his address? And he didn't quite understand that, yeah, that's theft, basically. Um, but... You know, is it really? I don't know. Napster had a problem with it, so I can kind of see what the issue is. But all this work, all this time, all this effort into a tune, and somebody's just going to give it away? Like, really? I've even heard of people selling that tune. That ends up not working out too well. So, anyway, I, I get why they do it. Frank's saying, what's cooking? You got the ball guy with the shades. I like it. Got the flex. Four seconds saying, I gave up on my tuner after five failed uh, trips to TNT. Tune was locked. Uh, failed one two shift. Couldn't do squat, but wait till work week for new revision. Well, that's the thing. I mean, that's, you know, it, go to a different tuner. If you start having problems right off the bat, you start having issues like that right off the bat, either they haven't had a time to vet that tune or. I don't know. That's a problem. I guess tuning being locked can be a double-edged sword. It depends on the consumer. Gary's asking, where'd you get it tuned? Oh, Sambo's saying, Jay Green tunes my car, but sometimes I feel when I log it uh, to make sure it's okay. He just says everything looks good and doesn't want to do anything, even though I've changed some things. I don't know. It could be me overthinking. It could be. It depends on what you've changed. I mean, you know, this is one of those situations where, okay, so did you change to a different cold air? Um, that's really not going to change anything in your tune. Did you change to a different gear? Well, that could be some, that could be a reason to have to go in and make some changes to that tune. Um, would you put nitrous on it? That would be a definite reason to have to change the tune. So, there's a lot of reasons to have to change the tune and there's a lot of reasons to not even have to touch it. So, you know, that's kind of a specific thing there. Four shades saying rhymes with asshole off. <laughs> 
for saying at least Jay doesn't lock his tunes, stand up guy. Well, I mean, again, I locking a tune or not locking it. I mean, it's it's up to the tuner, and a lot of tuners will lock a tune because they've had their tunes lifted. So, you know, it's up to each tuner to either lock it or, or not lock it. Uh, let's see. It's like uh, four shaking and sambo are chilling. Let's see. Oh, you're saying I use uh, Petty's Garage, but if I was closer, I'd try the one that B Mason reps. Uh, but I know and work with Tech with Matt the Tuner. No, he knows my part. Good deal. Someone's asking if I use Pites. I use me. I'm the guy that tunes my car. Uh, but I used to work at Pites, and I learned under Alex. And um, I do things a little bit differently than he does. Uh, we don't. What's funny is that I learned so much from Alex, especially with the Mopars. I don't do everything the exact same that he does. There's some things that. Uh, that I do that are maybe a little bit more basic. Uh, there's some things that, um, you know, I, I kind of kind of a keep it simple type issue with mine. But again, mine aren't very aggressive because I've just had so many issues with fuel quality. So, and also, not only do I do my own tuning, but I do a ton of data logging in the process. And, you know, when you've got that much data on board, you kind of learn to you figure out what the car likes and what it doesn't like. So it's easier for me. And it's also easy for me to say that, um, you know, I know that my car is not very timing sensitive. In fact, it's very unsensitive when it comes to timing. So I just default back to less timing and car seems to run pretty good. But for labor and whatnot, yeah, no, Pites does all my all of my work. If I'm not doing it myself, um, or if it's something that requires specialized tools, then it will be done at Pites. Oh, Gary saying he knows Chris from MMX. Worked with him. MMX great parts place. But done. Then <laughs> told him my tuning will not be done with MMX. Yeah. Chuck saying the shop quoted him uh, ten grand for the Pro Charger, seven grand for the long tubes, cam and tune. It would sit between a Scat and a Hellcat, six hundred forty horsepower. I should just be satisfied with my shaker. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what's funny is that you know we're at Mopar Fest today, and you know it never fails. You know it's one Pro Charged car for every. I don't know, 30 Hellcat variants. So I know, um, you know, Legmaker's car, you know, Chris's car is fast as hell, you know, definitely an eight second capable car. Uh, but you know, the only really fast pro charger out there, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, same as saying he wish he had a shop near him. Yep. Gary saying dang seven grand for just long tubes, cam and tune only. Uh, believe it or not, that's not that bad deal. Uh, not, not that bad of a deal um, if it's including the long tubes because, you know, long tubes being, you know, say 1400 bucks for a set of cooks. I don't even think that includes the high flow cats. Plus, you start getting into cam, cam cores, things like that. You can get past 6500 pretty quickly. So, seven grand, I mean... Maybe a little bit pricey, but not outside of the range of what I've seen. I can tell you that. Let's see. Scott's asking to unlock a PCM on a stock 2016 RT shaker and then get a basic tune. Uh, not sure what the tune would involve. It would be a uh, tune involves a lot of stuff. Um, these tunes are not C spot run type of tunes. These are, pretty complicated tunes, actually. A lot more complicated than you might think, especially if you're used to an old school, like A9L type of computer with a J9 port or something like that. But uh, let's see, the tune all the way around, if you did engine and transmission, which I highly suggest, 
Uh, I mean, for guessment on cost and benefits uh, on the track, well, I'll put it to you like this. Uh, with If it's HP tuners, you've got to license the, the, the files and everything else for that car. So you're looking at 750 on the engine side, another 400 for the transmission side. It's going to take on an eddy current dyno, it's going to take about four hours to dial everything in just right to load test it and everything else on the actual dyno. And then probably an hour ish worth of street validation for the trans tune. And then because trans tune, a lot of trans tuning is very subjective. Coming back into the trans tune, you may need to make a trip or two back to take a couple of real quick trips around the block just for partial throttle drivability, things like that. And that's really more to fine tune it for what you like and your driving style. But um, you're looking at, you know, 1150 plus about five hours ish worth of time, give or take. And as far as what does that get you at the track? Well, you got to remember Chalandra was a 2016 SRT Challenger. And in really good DA, we were running 1130s with that car pretty consistently on 20 inch, basically running the car at full weight with a, with a uh, rear seat delete. And uh, no, that was at full weight with the back seat in the car. And then the rear seat delete went in the car. I think that's how that went. Anyway, um, one way or another, we did another car full weight reduction, same thing. Uh, with a rear seat delete, drag pack, and the passenger seat out. And that's that's what constituted a you know weight reduction for that car. And that car went 11.25 with me driving it. So, you know, as far as what can you expect? You expect to go from like 11, from a 16, an 11.90 car down to an 11.30-ish car at the drag strip. 11.40, depending on the air that you're running in. The newer operating system is a little bit more aggressive. And um, although you'd never see it on a dyno, they do run better at the track. <laughs> Chuck's saying, yes, expensive. Um, but hopefully that, that gives you an idea as far as benefits and costing and stuff like that. For shaking saying, okay, so 17 grand for 640 horsepower sounds like a fair deal. Nothing is cheap. Yeah, it's, it is, but it isn't. I mean, you remember that $17,000. I mean, you got 17,000 paper dollars laying around to throw at that car and it's going to put down, you know, Hellcat-ish power, but it's not going to run like a Hellcat. It's not going to have that instant hit like a Hellcat does. It's kind of hard to say. I mean, you'd probably be better off if you got that kind of fold money laying around, take a car plus your 17 grand and coming back home with a Hellcat. And the reason why I say that is because of how much experience I have with pro charge cars. I, the, here's the problem. You haven't driven one yet. And what I mean by driven one is you haven't driven a pro charge car and then turn around and drive a stock Hellcat you will come away with a completely different appreciation for a Hellcat if you do that. And I, I have to fall back on one, one of the cars that came through and the, you, you do car after car after car after car after car after car after car. And, and the thing is, is that there are some builds that just stand out that you remember either because they were really good or sometimes really bad or, in some cases, they're just kind of cars that you just kind of, that left you like, huh, hmm. Like, on paper, it looked good, but it just didn't work out. One of those cars was a pro charge car, and the owner was really adamant about getting 700 horsepower to the rear wheels with this thing. And I did the math on the cam, put the cam together, and we ran the car on race gas because, you know, you, there's only so much power that 11 and a half to one compression and boost will manage on, you know, pump gas. 
But the idea was that, you know, we figured we could probably pull six and a quarter or 650 out of the thing. And then on race gas, you know, probably get close to 700. We actually hit 706 with that car, I think was the final number. And um, backed it down a little bit, but still on a, on, a, on a cooler pass, but not an actual cool down like Halo Pass that made exactly 700. So we hit the number. So it sounds like a lot of power, right? 700 horsepower, and that's roughly 300 horsepower more than the car laid down stock. Off to a good start, right? But the weird thing about that car is that it was the slowest 700 horsepower to the rear wheel feeling car that I'd ever driven. And I couldn't really put my finger on it. Like, it just felt lazy and a lot of that had to do with the cam I mean, the cam was designed to make horsepower at the big end it was designed to make a number it was designed for roll racing so it you know it's designed to do a specific thing and it's going to feel completely different than a stock cam with the same configuration and the car probably had a little bit more in it had we changed pulleys but we kind of met the goal and you know once the missions achieved you know, mission accomplished, move on to the next thing. There's only so much R&D you can do with something that you've kind of done before, but customer is happy. Customer, customer was scared to death of the car and um, at first and then, you know, warmed up to it and got to learn it. And I just remember data logging the car. And you have to remember that I was, in many cases, the first guy to drive a car and then the last guy to drive a car. And that worked out pretty good because... You know, I knew what the car drove like before. I know what it's going to drive like afterwards. And, you know, once the 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 bulk of the tuning was done to the car, it might be up to me to make some changes to shift uh, to shift uh, points and, the, you know, trans tuning and some other little things to the car. But nothing too major. You know, I mean, I, it, but it, but in many cases, I was doing a lot of making a lot of changes to these things. And God, just the car felt. Like you knew it was fast because the speedometer was moving kind of fast, but it just didn't, it wasn't like freak you out fun punchy the way that a Hellcat can be with very little modification done to it at all. I mean, 309 gear, a tune, and a tire. And it's a just a completely different car, extremely happy feeling car. And it's not loading up at lights. It's not requiring a special fuel. It's not doing any of that. It's just happy little Hellcat, out to have time, wants to make friends. You know, it's not some snarling thing. You know, it's just a lot of fun to drive. So um, be kind of mindful of what you're doing with that centrifugal supercharger. And if you decide to do a build on a centrifugal supercharger, don't go light with it. Go full fuel system, E85, run about 12 pounds of boost with it. Uh, eight rib conversion with a race intercooler with an F1 or at least a D1X. Spin, the, spin it up pretty good. In other words, don't, don't try to go light with it. Make sure you build something and you pulley something for, you know, 12 pounds of boost at 6,200 RPM, get it into that kind of a realm. And then the car does wake up and they run pretty good. But I don't know. It's just kind of a weird, it's a weird existence when you get into those types of builds because they just don't, it's like they do, but they don't feel fast. You know, you, you just, you look down at the speedometer and wow, this thing's getting to, you know, 140 miles an hour, it feels okay. But it's just like it keeps pulling, but it never, it doesn't have that crispness to it. So anyway, just my experience with those things. Dad's saying, always welcome, my friend. Thank you, buddy. PD saying, you should be at the Motorplex. Man, I just got back from uh, Houston Raceway Park. Uh, Mopar Fest. I've been there literally all day. I'm, what is finally happening is the 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 sunscreen's finally getting out of my eyes, man. I've been these suckers are burning like you wouldn't believe. 
Gary saying, well, I do all my own mechanical work myself, but I do not mess with tuning. Yeah, a lot of it's, it can be, it's a pretty steep learning curve. I can tell you that. Chuck saying his shop's very good. They do awesome builds, but expensive to mod there. They can do it all paint too. That's very important. The shop that's got uh, auto body is very cool. Saying uh, nothing is final to put it on the dyno, so the horsepower and torque numbers are what they estimated for me. That's good. Same as saying, would running uh, incorrect timing cause a car to run hotter than normal? It can. Um, one of the one of the creepier things is if you're not running enough timing, you'll have real high exhaust temperature, and you'll see manifolds glowing red and things like that. That's from not running enough timing. Guys think that pulling timing is safe. And it's not always safer. As a matter of fact, it can be detrimental. And even if you're running the correct air fuel ratio, um, you've got a lot more of that air fuel ratio passing past an open exhaust valve and an open exhaust valve isn't seated. So there's nowhere for the heat to go except into the head of that valve, which is what is then cause for that valve to then be drawn up and potentially tulipped into that valve seat. So uh, in that respect, it can run hotter. If you're running um, timing that's too advanced, what can happen is, and that's on the exhaust side, if you're running timing that's too advanced, uh, it can cause the car to run a little bit hotter uh, it just depends on how advanced it's running. So, uh, you know, doing a lot of idling or something like that, it's idling at a high uh, advanced value, then yeah, it can definitely cause it to run a little bit hotter. Speed Freaks asking, hey B, any word on the 2022 Hellcats and 392s in production or available yet? Any difference in the new model year? None that I'm aware of and no news that I can tell you, unfortunately. Um, hmm. Gary's asking, what are your thoughts on the TTI step headers for a 2020 M6 SCAT with 8 to 13 inch collector extension and a custom H pipe? Uh, did not steal idea. Mason already had an extra Hellcat mid pipe being modded. Um, no, I just haven't been able to locate. Uh, in fact, I went looking for one the other day at Hel stock Hellcat Challenger exhaust. Um, it's a great way to go about it. Uh, custom H pipe uh, with a three inch mid pipe. Get the job done for you pretty good. Uh, the step headers are pretty good too. So I, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't advise against them. Uh, folks that I know of that have used any type of a step header have liked them. So, uh, you know, how much of a, an advantage over the other headers? Can't really tell you that. I can tell you that a long tube header is going to be good for building power down low. It is not a, a top end type of a horsepower gain. So with a stepped header, if you're going from say one and seven eighths to two inch, what you may find with that header, and I am not gonna say it's a guarantee, but what you may find is a little bit less responsive than a say, for, for example, a set of uh, one and seven eighths like a true set of one and seven eighths headers, it may be a little bit less responsive down low under partial throttle conditions. And again, these are subject, I mean, it's definitely there, but again, as you're driving the car, it, it, you can almost count it as a subjective gain because it just depends on how the car feels. Um, but that stepped header may help it make power up top where the one and seven eighths would start to lose out to the shorty headers with the way that they're able to make power up top with that wider lobe separation angle cam that comes with the car from the factory. Now you start tightening up the lobe separation angle and you can take advantage of a little bit better scavenging with those step headers up top. Whereas the smaller diameter is gonna be a little bit more of, it's not a flow restriction, it's just a wave tuning restriction it's, it's a uh, it's a rather it's a pressure uh, wave that you're tuning at that point 
And the idea with a step tatter is it's a smaller pipe going to a larger pipe, which is to say it's a larger volume. When that, when that pulse hits the larger volume, the gas slows down which creates a slight relative vacuum, lower pressure on the back side of that where the, where the pipe actually gets wider. Actually, it goes like that. It's a 90 really for those things. That is to help scavenging. And it's set up like that to where you get some, most of the benefits for regular long tube header with less of the detriments of a long tube header at higher RPM values. So that's why they exist. And they do a pretty good job. You'll notice in some cases you'll get, like from your point of view, you'll get a, a torque curve that goes up and maybe comes down and then has a second peak. That's what's that's what's happening with that. It's it's coming up, going down. You're not losing anything. That's just the natural curve of the of the of the the torque curve. But in this case, it may arc up a little bit, and you'll get like a a little freebie of power uh, at at a high mid range uh, power level. That's what they can do sometimes to the torque curve. So each combination is a little bit different, but you know, for a wide lobe separation angle cam, it it probably would do that now that I'm thinking about it. Pretty cool stuff. Oh, for saying, yeah, I, I agree. It spin the 17 on a, on a Hellcat and said, yeah. Um Oh, four seconds. Here. I've spent over seventy-five hundred with my scat with cam headers stall and enjoy, um, and enjoy car less than stock. Uh, get the Hellcat. Yeah. The thing is, if you get the wrong cam, and so this is what I was trying to say in that video that I put together, you know, talking about cams. The the problem with cams is, if you get they they all cost the same to install. Okay, so and that should kind of go without saying, but it's kind of, I'm saying that really more to make a point here. Get the right cam for your car. If you get the wrong cam, an older cam design with a wide lobe separation angle and, you know, a, a, maybe a little bit too much duration or duration uh, without a tight lobe separation angle or without the right lobe in, intake center line it can make the car lazy. And the problem is that you're going up against a cam that, although really not ideal and really, to be honest with you, set up more like a positive displacement supercharger cam. I can tell you the stock 392 cam would make a wicked uh, uh, E-Force cam. You get a stock manual 392 cam and put that in a in a 5.7 with an E-Force and be that's a combination. Um, anyway, I digress. The um, be real, real, real snappy with boost response. Just saying. But um, yeah, the the problem is that the wrong cam in these engines makes them feel lazy. It doesn't matter what the power number ends up being the trip, the ride to that power number is just not that fun. And what I, this is one of the things that I've seen, and this is what scares me with some guys who start asking me about camshafts. Let me just draw this thing out for you. One of the weirder things, especially with some of the older grind cams, you know, the, the back in the day cams, um, is that you'd have this torque curve You'd have a torque curve that would start out, or a horsepower, let's talk about horsepower, it's easier to, to, for you guys to visualize that. That would start out and it would look basically just like this. That would be your stock horsepower curve for any of these cars, 392s especially. And they would carry power pretty well out. You get a little bit of overrun, but the idea is that you don't really have to shift them that high. And what would happen with these aftermarket cams is that the power curve would do this. And I'll just put little dots all over it. Okay, so kind of the dotted line would be that aftermarket camshaft. And some of the older grinds never got any better than until the very top up here 
where you're never even going to be able to feel it. And they were kind of flat all the way downstairs. And so the torque, you know, your normal torque curve, you know, would, would kind of basically do something roughly the same where it would look like that. You know, it'd be less up until the very end and then it would start to crest over. And it kind of looked like one of those old comparisons between a single plane intake manifold and a dual plane intake manifold. It was kind of weird how some of those older cams would seem to respond. And the driving experience, that's a bit of a, like just a cheap illustration for you real quick, but it's, it would play itself out with how the car felt to drive. It just didn't feel like, it just felt gutless down low. But the bad part about it, that's at wide open throttle. One of the one of the calling cards for a scat pack, and one of the reasons why people gravitate to the scatties over the Mustang, and, I, and I'm using the Mustang specifically because the Camaro is an also ran at this point, and as much as it pains me to say, because I I'd love to do a build on a Camaro, but there's just no support for it. The reality is that. The calling card of the 392 is that bam, snap throttle response. There is nothing, very few cars that are as snappy as a 392. And given the weight of the car, you kind of need that. You need that torque to be able to rip you out of the hole. With one of those cams, it just didn't have it. And so... That's one of the what got real what really got me into the whole putting cams together for him. He's seen was I had it's about four years ago, five years ago. I had was that long ago? It really was. I'm driven a car, it was an SRT charger with a comp 270 cam in it. And the car felt like a dud. It just didn't have that. It just didn't feel right. And, and I had my 2016. And that car just felt so much snappier. And I was thinking to myself, damn, I mean, <laughs> my car feels faster. If I had bought that car with that cam in it, and had never driven a 392 car, I would maybe be happy with it, but I wouldn't be impressed by it. You drive a stock cam to 392 car with just a tune. And I was like, my car will eat this thing for breakfast. It won't even be close. So that's one of the reasons why I thought, man, somebody can do this better. And I had some experience with it. And all my engine knowledge and engine math knowledge. I was like, well, let me put one together, put one together and ended up being one of my favorite cams ever. Very first one I ever did. No lope, makes great power everywhere from the hit. It's basically like adding displacement to the 392 is how that car runs. And, um, you know, is it a huge game? Uh, it's not a huge game, but you're already starting out so high to be able to get much more out of it and retain street ability is kind of a tall order. This isn't an LS where you're starting out with a cam that's, or an engine that's under cam, like significantly under cam from the factory is quite the opposite. So, um, and that's the Pipes CD01 grind. And that cam is really what set us off in putting cams together and putting these cam packages together that, you know, in the right car, I mean, you know, Quick Brakes car, 4,600 pound car goes out and runs an 1120, a 4,600 pound car. Uh, Challengers with that cam package have gone into the tens. So, cheers on that, right? But that's one of the one of the things I always would would caution guys on is. Be careful with cams in those cars. It doesn't always work out. It Nowadays, with some of the custom grinds, they're pretty good, though. So, 
Um, let's see. Oh, Chuck's saying that's what I was thinking. Just get the super stock like I was planning anyways. <laughs> the RT is a lot of fun, though. RTs are fun. Let's see. Let's see. Four Shagans hanging out with Gary. Let's see. Oh, four Shagans saying Gearheads and Mansfield did the mechanical. That's good. They do good work. Let's see, Sambo's asking, could I send you a log to see if my timing is acceptable? Uh, I do not do uh, tune evaluations. I will do stuff for shops, but um, I don't like getting back and forth with looking at people's tunes because <laughs> I just really don't have the time to do it, unfortunately. Uh, who did your tune first? And just ask me here, you know, what, what, give me a, give me a spot, uh, give me a, an air charge and uh, give me a tune value at what RPM, a, a timing value at what RPM, I can probably tell you if you're in the ballpark. Um, you know, high air charge values, you want to be less than 19. So if you're 16 to 18, you should be in pretty decent, uh, pretty decent place, depending on your, uh, your fuel quality, 91 versus 93 octane. <clears throat> but if you're seeing numbers that are fairly close to that, you know, like a, like at, uh, like a 100 kPa ish air charge, be in pretty good shape there. Gary's saying the header setup will go with the complete engine build I have planned along with your Warlock cam, good cam, or custom uh, I plan to do through the shop you recommended through Dr. Diff. I would say, yeah, the Warlock's a pretty pretty cool cam. Um, I, you know, we did it in that uh, that road run with the 392 swap. Wasn't the most ideal exhaust setup for it, though. He had kind of a smaller diameter set of headers. I think they were one and three quarter, actually. I don't think they were one and seven eighths. Running through two and a half with no crossover. So, and on that Mustang Dyno, I think it put in like 460 or something like that. Which would have put it like it, I don't know, on a Dyno Jet, probably 490. But... Again, the exact wrong exhaust system for that type of a setup. Not totally bad, but undersized, to say the least, for the type of power that thing was should have been making. Mark saying, sup, B, uh, about to do some springs for his RT, and now in the market for a decent performance tire setup. Tough to beat the Nittos right now, man. I have been, I know I've, kind of bash on them for how they look but in terms of longevity they seem to be doing pretty well so can't really get mad about that chuck saying smash that like button hit it uh same with saying an idle it's like 22 23 and wide open it's like 18 or so uh, i'll get back to you when i have the computer yeah if it's like it around 18 you should be good 18 so the thing is is that some cars respond fine at 18 i've done timing sweeps with 392s um, and the funny thing about 392s is I've done timing sweeps from 16 to 22 and we did it with race gas and the thing because peak power is not, you, you, okay. So you might be surprised to hear this, but peak power is not timing dependent. In other words, if I tell you that a car makes with 93 octane peak power at 17 degrees of timing and you put race gas in it and you say oh well hell I can I can bump that up to 22 degrees of timing I can throw four degrees of timing at it you could be far past your MBT mark your maximum brake torque mark for that RPM because horsepower is just a 
it's an interesting thing, but it, you're, you're really measuring torque and it's factored in and you're thought of, you're thinking about it as torque. If your torque goes up, then by definition, your horsepower goes up. So, um, but I've done timing sweeps with cars and we did this with Quick Brakes car too, by the way, both with the stock tune or rather both with the stock cam and with the CDO one grind. And I've done it with the Hellcat. I've done it with the Hellcat while I was at the track. And it was really more a, um, how, do you, how do you say this? It was more a function of density altitude changing by just a little bit to where it put the car into a different timing, uh, a timing column or timing row, I should say. But here's what we found. And so anyway, the, the, the point of that is you run a fuel to where when you go past your MBT mark, you don't get detonation. You just basically have too much timing in it, but you start to lose power. It doesn't detonate because the fuel is so much resistance to detonation that it just doesn't detonate. You don't damage anything. You're just going past your MBT mark. And what we found is the 392 with that uh, with the 2016 operating system and with the cam set up the way that it was, we I couldn't get the car to make more power at 18 or 19 or 20 degrees of timing that it was making at 17. Um, you know, a lot of cars will idle at, you know, 20, 21 degrees. I have to go back and take a look. In fact, I got my computer sitting right here. Let's see if I can do that real quick while I'm explaining this. Luckily, my computer came back alive too. I had a, uh, a bit of a scare with it today where it not only overheated, but it was completely, un just absolutely non-responsive all the way around. Um, let's dig into this real quick and I'll give you an idea. Just because we're kind of early into the show here. Get this thing to get with it. And grandma's slow, but she was old, man. This thing is just creeping. There we go. File. It's always fun digging around in some of these older tunes. Let's see. Not responding. Of course, it's not responding. It's a piece of shit. All right. Uh, let's see. Open HP tuners. Bear with me just a second. This will take a minute. Minute of your time, minute of your time, hold please. Let's go revisit Chalandra. Engine idle. Airflow. Some of these are funny because they're so old. So many revisions back. Let's see. Sparky. Advanced. Heart throttle base. So with practically no, uh, no throttle input whatsoever, I would be looking at like around 17 degrees for 672, 896-ish RPM. 17 to 18 degrees at idle, so maybe a little bit overtimed at idle. Just tipping into the throttle and start ramping up to like 19. But that's in essence what a part throttle spark table would look like. You can see it. So you can pause that and get to that, but. Um, you know, heavy loads. You got to remember that the these things don't go past air charge of, uh, you know, 100 grams. So, you know, you're not going to see a whole lot of uh, variation in timing on that. But that is a uh, tune that I put together in June of 2018. Uh, it's 12th revision, <laughs> trans 12 plus one percent. Oh, that's uh, me adjusting. So I literally was making fine adjustments, adding 1% to uh, 
to this trans tune. Probably did a global across the board on that. Um, yeah, wide open throttle at base, it's all hovering at right at 18 degrees. So at around air charges, depend on density, altitude, and all of that. Um, so get into the thermals and things like that. But um, anyway, this is the thermal spark table. If you ever wondered when the car starts getting hot, this is what that spark table looks like. And when people ask me, well, how much timing do you run? It's like, look, you see that air charge? Uh, you see that RPM? Okay, you got to factor all of that in. And then you find that one cell at what RPM, which air charge is basically density altitude. The lower on the chart, the deeper the DA is. But uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, it, it, it works great at X timing it's like yeah that's your that's the thermal though so but you get the idea <clears throat> let's see what other gems can I pull out of can I pull out of this one um, hot spark tables everybody was asking me do how much did I adjust the hot spark tables on Shalandra when I was running those numbers you want to see I'll show you <laughs> I'm still pulling timing. Still yanking timing out of that thing for hot spark. So people thought that I was going in and jacking with all the torque multipliers and timing multipliers and all of that. It's like, nope, that's the IAT, ECT. You think I'm trying to, you know, fool it. You're not going to fool it anywhere. There's the ECT. A little bit less in stock, but still pulling timing so it's not like i was cheating or anything like that this isn't like a full-on race gas tune this was on bucky's 93 octane so let's see what was i doing with noxon eh, we're not going to talk about knock sensor sensitivity okay we're just going to leave that this um still running torque management Little bit, little, little bit taken out, but not too much. I haven't played with this one, this tune in a long time. It's a pretty good little tune, B Mason. Not bad. They're a sport. Let's see. And then, if you ever wondered, I mean, there's so much to this trans tuning. It ends up looking the same. It's just so many different, uh, so many different parameters, and it just it can get so tedious changing, changing everything. So anyway. Hopefully that helps you out. Hey, Dad, thank you very much. I was saying the other one was just because of your awesomeness. Thanks, man. Uh, this was for the MacBook Pro fun. Dude, i tell you what, man. This Lenovo POS, man. All this stuff, I mean, I'm sure you could run it on 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 any anything Apple, which would be far and away better than this crap. Um yeah so these itty bitty screws on the back of this thing one of them pops out this one is the one for you can see where it's all jacked up back here that's actually where the power button is for this thing and of course it's you know the power button on these things is just a little dip switch so I took this thing apart took the back panel off of it dug around back here saw where it had actually gotten kind of hot the the actual battery portion looked like it got really hot and discolored the back cover apparently these things have a problem with that I, I don't i'm not really smart when it comes to that i mean i can take it apart and fix it but you know i don't know the various nuances of a lenovo computer but um but yeah, it's a pisser because it is a dip switch and you're at the, the mercy of a dip switch. So I can't just go control alt O and it, and it makes it come on, right? Like, oh man, my dip switch broke. I got to control alt O this thing to, you know, to wake it up every time. Can't even do that. So, and it's, it's embedded in the circuit board. So I couldn't go in and actually bridge across the, the dip switch. So I'm sitting there looking at it going, this is stupid. Um, so anyway, yeah, I was 
having to actually do a little surgery on this thing and I had part of the board apart and I was trying to get that all figured out and I, I don't know what the deal was. I don't know if I got sweat in that dip switch or what, but I played around with it and had it all pulled apart and it was cooling off in here and I think it just got too hot and because I had it all torn apart, it just cooled off. So, um, let's see. Sovereign saying you need a Panasonic Tough Book. They're not cheap, but they're industrial tough. I probably should. <laughs> Clay saying you're lucky that laptop did not catch fire. Probably am. Clay saying a Toshiba satellite laptop. I'll take whatever I can get. Brian Cantu saying is thirty four thousand good for a twenty sixteen RT three ninety two Challenger? Uh, seventeen, roughly seventeen thousand miles. Um. Uh, it's not too terrible, but I would say I, I wouldn't be a buyer on that car for more than about 28, 29 ish, give or take. Um, I know that with today's market and all that, but I, I'd have a hard time coming in at 34. I would probably, I'm going to write that down tough book. I just need something that is not going to be all flowery and dainty like this thing is. But I appreciate the heads up on that. I'm not really, I mean, I am, I guess, a computer guy. I use this stuff a lot, but I don't, I don't really do a lot of gaming or anything like that. It just has to be able to do tuning and general computer stuff, really. Let's see. Oh, Mark saying, also found out my grandpa had a 69 Roadrunner with a 383 and my great uncle had an old Super B. Very cool. Looks like Mopar runs in my blood. I like it. Someone was saying, also have a Bolton 61, by the way. It's not that far off from those. Um, Ken said, hey, be late to the show. Are you against email file tunes if data logs are provided? No, not really. Uh, just a basic tune, 92 gas for bracket racing, or does the car need to be uh, dropped off? Um, if you are working with somebody that can log the car in real time using um, uh, any of the, the programs that allow you to stream, um, let's see, what is it? Uh, was it something, something 13? What was it? Hang on, let me find out the one that I was using. I always forget the name of this thing. I don't use it enough to really remember it. Hang on, all these things are... Quit it, computer. Oh, now this thing's going to hang up. Oh, isn't that cute? It's not... How can you be running slow? You're not attached to anything. Um, what was the name of that thing? When I see it, I'll know it. That's, that's the funny part of it. I've got it in here somewhere. Let's see. Works three. Da, 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 da. Hang on just a second. Let me see if I can find it for you. Ah, hell, I can't find it right now. Team viewer. Sorry, I was thinking Teams in my head. We use that at, for all this video conferencing crap. Team Viewer. If you got somebody with Team Viewer, what you can do is you'll have the log happening in real time, and that helps. If you're going back and forth with logs, you can get revisions and go back and forth that way. That's fine. I have done Team Viewer with you know Racer X's car with other other customers car while I was at pipes and then also did it with uh quick bricks car it would change stuff in real time for him especially if they're at the track he needed some support he'd call me up and say hey, i'm doing it's doing this or whatever i'd make a couple of changes he'd go out and win a race or two so um but yeah it's a uh yeah i mean you can definitely do that as long as you've got a tuner that can work with you in real time. A lot of times, 
you know, unless the guy's sitting in front of his computer and, and can work with you directly back and forth with the logs. And you have to make sure that you have the right config file and, and that's usually handled by the, the, the guy that's doing the logging anyway. So it can be done and it's not bad. Uh, let's see. Uh, Clay's asking, do you think a 93 Lamborghini Diablo VT could beat a 2021 Chevrolet Corvette V8 Z51? Um, probably because I think the horsepower was higher for the Lambo, but it would be fairly close, but they were heavier though. I don't know, it'd be fairly close until the vet really started moving. I think the vet may carry it on the big end. So you're getting back into where I was earlier, Clay, saying you're lucky the thing didn't catch on fire. Um, let's see. Or Clay saying, or an IBM ThinkPad. Dell makes some tougher models. Yeah. In fact, my Dell, my Dell work computer, what is this thing? This is a, I don't know what this damn thing is. Anyway, it's, it's your basic Latitude 5490. That's this monster. This one's actually not bad at all. I, I haven't had any real issues with that. I do, what I need though is I need one. I need one that the keyboard lights up on. And I need one that the keyboard lights up on so that if I'm doing street hits at night and I'm data logging and I've got the thing open, I don't have to go searching for, for letters so I can like home in on something. I can just, you know, oh, you know, I can start typing pretty quickly. That's the only thing that I would like to have, but it's more of a luxury than a necessity. Uh, let's see. Clay's asking, what do you think about the 69 Dodge Charger Daytona with the 426 cubic inch Hemi with a four-speed manual transmission? Um, so the Charger Daytona was a pretty cool car. The 426, again, you know, you get into the 426 versus 440 crowd. There are reasons why the there, there's such a within the Mopar community this 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 inner inner family rivalry there. So the 426, if you're talking about just the street Hemi, was a bit of a turd to drive. And I know this because I've driven them, I've dynoed them. I, you know, it's just. That car versus the 440, if you were to drive them both back to back and you were just driving them, you weren't racing them. These things are not at wide open throttle or anything like that. The overwhelming value that you would come away from was that the, the 426 feels lazy down low. Whereas the 440 just pops down low. The 440, the 392 has a lot of the 440 type DNA in it. It just so happens that the 392 has the pop down low and the pull up top from the Hemi all in one engine. And that's why uh, when I put that video together, it's been years ago, but I've touched on this a few times, you know, is the 392, the absolute best engine Dodge has ever made. And I've come back and said yes on numerous occasions from a naturally aspirated power plant standpoint. The 392 is by far my favorite because it brought what you would hope that a Hemi would have run like back in the day. It brought that to the masses. And you can't really say that for the Hemi back then. Again, the ones that I've driven were more or less stock or tuned up stock examples. And you'd rather have the 440, man, I'm telling you, for a street car. And what you'd rather do is you'd rather have the 440 today. You take the 440, put a really good set of cylinder heads on it, put a RPM air gap intake or anything else like that, an 850 Edelbrock carburetor or a and just pick anything like a 750 HP Holly ish type carb 950 Holly HP probably better good aggressive camshaft 
something like a 235, 240-ish cam, 550 lift, good set of springs. That thing's going to make a ton of power. It'll make power that the Hemi won't be able to make without a lot of parts. It's going to come in far cheaper and it will have gobbledygooks more torque down low than that Hemi will have because it'll have so much better cylinder velocity. So, and you guys who have been around the channel will know this statistic. I've said it a jillion times, but you got to remember port velocity is what gives you throttle response. And high port velocity at the point of having high uh, port velocity is where the engine really starts to come alive and or usually has its best throttle response. And the 440 had the same port velocity at 4,700 RPM that the Hemi had at 6,200 RPM. So it gives you an idea. You know, the Hemi came under cammed from the factory. Uh, it needed a significantly bigger cam and it's a lot of significantly bigger insert things here that would make it a complete disaster to try to drive on the street. It's It, it would do things that would be really cool for about two weeks and you want to get rid of it afterwards because it would load up at lights and would haul ass don't don't get it twisted the car is really fast when you set it up the right way but i mean that every compromise had to be made for it to get to that point you build a 440 there really aren't a lot of compromises in fact it just kind of enhances the fun of the car uh someone's saying go to dell's website and look up latitude 52 54 20 isn't that what i have what did i say the same was which one was it Yeah, this one's a 5490. So kind of the same value, it sounds like. So, yeah. Um, Team Viewer Remote. Yeah, so it's like Team Viewer 13 is the one that I use. I got that juxtaposed in my brain with uh, teams, apparently. Uh, Clay saying they do have laptops with glow in the dark keys. I have seen them. Yes, they do. Um, oh, Chuck saying uh, his Lenovo has been good. Um, I'm not saying this one hasn't been good. I'm saying it's just not very durable. I mean, I definitely did not pick their most robust, um, the, the most robust example of their of their chassis, if nothing else. Uh, for Shake is asking, did my 392 have an aftermarket stall? No. Um, and he's asking, when do you recommend lock for the TCC? You know what? I never changed it from stock because I had a stock cam in it. Um, some guys will leave it unlocked in first gear and second gear and will lock it in third with some of the cammed cars, the more radical cam cars, before we started doing our own cams and, you know, we're putting some things together that would work with the stock converter, uh, having it unlocked in first, second, and third gear. Let me see something here. Let's uh, go back into the trans tune, give you some specifics here. Torque converter, apply and release, torque converter clutch mapping, which, by the way, if you've never seen a torque converter map, it's all over the place. Then I can show you what it looks like. It just, so you get it, this is kind of an older version of this. This is, <laughs> there are 90 maps, okay? for a torque converter lockup and whatnot. This is maps 81 through 90. When you start getting the slip to into unlock slip and then lock at various accelerator positions. Um, anyway, this is what one of those starts to look like. That's 81 through 90 and each one of those is its own map, basically. So if that does any good for you. Um, and what we would do 
is you can go to TCC enable gears and that would be if it's got a it's it's a binary it's a if it's a yes or no if it's a one there it it will lock and if it's a zero it will not and of course the z the hp transmission is uh it has 15 gears that could possibly be in that type of a configuration in this case you're only dealing with an eight speed so but um yeah, to give you an idea, there's so much of that. So really, with the with the stock cam, or even with fairly radical cams, don't even bother with TCC mapping or anything like that because it just gets, you can get so deep in the weeds with that that uh, it, it, will, it will drive you insane, frankly. Um, and then like I'm scrolling down here to the bottom of one of these. So you'll get into, these are TCC, some more TCC mapping here. This is maps one through 10. Hang on. Where eight through 10 are the other gears. And of course the 10,000 is just a max value, so. That's what that would end up looking like. Bottom of that. Hopefully that helps you. So you start getting into that, and it's you go to a different converter, and sometimes you start changing that up, and you start finding that the changing of it up doesn't really make that big of a difference, and so you just leave it unlocked and call it good. You can start getting into the nth degree with some of these things, and it just can get to a real real headache honestly but these are all output shaft rpms so uh not engine rpms usually because engine rpms aren't at 220. let's see what else we got in here get into shift pressures and all that I never really got nuts with shift pressures and trans tuning. I may ramp them up a little bit here and there, uh, but I typically don't go too crazy. I like to keep a, I like to keep a feel that's very OE with it. Just you know, and still have distinct, um, still have distinct modes to the thing. Um, you can always ramp the thing up if you wanted to but in fact i need to go back through this which reminds me i need to go back through and take notes of my actual pid locations in my in my uh in my transmission tuning and correlate those with some of the new terminology or some of the newer terminology that had come out a while back i just never did it's uh aggression one aggression two versus normal performance sport etc so Clay's asking uh, but would you say the 318 cubic inch 5.2 liter LA Chrysler to be the best small block Chrysler made no I would suggest that the 360 would be the best in that respect um, it's just bigger it makes more torque for the same horsepower and I have seen those engines take a beating. Same with the 318, but if you're going to measure the two together, I'd take the 360 just because it makes more torque down low. Um, you talk about the 440 being available and everything, pretty much. Oh, uh, Chuck saying just showing his local shop web info. Did I miss it? Sometimes if there's a, oh, for you guys that will sometimes send me uh, uh, anything with a web link, a lot of times I can't see that. So if you have sent me something with a web link and I, and I haven't responded to you, it's not that I'm not, it's not that I'm ignoring you. It's that a lot of times I just can't see the link and I can't respond to you. A, um, I can't res respond to something if I can't, if I literally cannot see that link. So, 
Let's see. Chuck is checking out. Clay saying Walmart has their own branded computers. Hey, at least they have a refund, right? The other thing that sucked about this Lenovo is I, I didn't really pay attention to this, but the um the uh the what's it called? The um the warranty wasn't all that awesome with this thing. Oh, uh, Doc's talking about some uh uh transmission tuning specific stuff. Uh, Rift is using ZH tunes, my boy Z. Brian's asking, would you say a 2015 Challenger Hellcat with 17,000 miles for 47.9 is a good deal? Yeah, it is for today's climate. I would check the Carfax report, make sure that any TSBs had been addressed. I may or may not need supercharger bearings. Actually, by 17,000 miles, they would have already failed. I would also suggest maybe doing a read file on it, or if nothing else, go in and check to see if it's been tuned. If it's got the 1405 code, it has definitely been tuned. or at least unlocked, but it's been tuned and probably put back to stock. The thing with the Hellcats though, it takes a lot to sting a Hellcat. It really does. And if you're running quality gas in it with a conservative tune, which a conservative tune only means in this case that you're not trying to throw timing at it that the car doesn't need anyway. And that's why I've done all of these tests with various fuels and timing sweeps and done testing at the drag strip to see if the car would even pick up. Because see, one of the things is dinos are a funny little animal. There are cases where the dino will not show a game. And this is one of the running jokes with Mopars is that you know, you, you do some engine tuning to the car and it picks up a little bit, but it would always end up just being faster at the track than what the gain would have suggested. You put a tune on the car, it picks up 12 horsepower, but somehow or another it picks up two tenths, right? And then in the trans tune, <coughs> there's some things in the trans tune that it may be a quirk uh, on the street that you don't like. It could be anything, just pick something. But um, what was interesting is that doing the timing sweeps with the different fuels on the dyno was one thing where we just weren't seeing any, any gains, but you take the car to the track, do the same sweep at the track, still not see any gains. In fact, my car was so insensitive to timing that it was, I thought it was, you'd almost think it was a fluke, but an extra two degrees of timing in the car still ran identical numbers to what it ran before. And the knock sensor voltage was practically identical. Go figure. And that is with pump gas, no additives, no nothing. So trying to, just trying to do whatever we could to get an edge out of it uh, at the drag strip versus, you know, <clears throat> played around with it on a dyno and still didn't get anything out of it. So Clay is asking, do you have an Instagram or Facebook account? I do not do Facebook. I do have an Instagram, but I don't really mess with it so much anymore. Uh, primarily because of what I was talking about earlier on, I would just get bombarded with questions at all hours of the night on my Instagram. And um, I just, ended up being more of a hassle than what it's worth. So if I do post anything on my Instagram, I think I've got a link to it in the, like the somewhere around there. I can't remember if it's up there or down there or where it was, but I had it on this page. And I, if I post up stuff, it's typically sometimes correlated. It's me injuring myself, which is apparently something that I do a lot. Um, 
might be, could be anything on that thing. For all I know, it could be a bug that I thought was cool. It could be, you, I don't know, who knows what's going to end up on that thing. So uh, just goofy stuff that I see, but I really don't do any back and forth too much anymore on my Instagram. Not, not very much at all. But if you look up Brian Mason, you'll, you'll see me in there somewhere. Um, Riff saying he got his 2015 Hellcat with 8,000 miles on it in December 2018 for 48K, but I know things are a lot different now. That is very true. So that'll kind of give you an idea. You know, the, the, the mileage deduct is, you know, not quite what it would have been in 2018 now, but, you know, I, like I say, the number is probably a good number. You know, I'd like to see it a little bit lower with that mileage, but, you know, if they're willing to work with you, great. But if not, I can kind of understand why. Summer Knight is uh, hanging out with Dr. Diff, it looks like. Say, uh, for Shake saying, any ideas why trans will not uh, uh, shift one to two wide open, even when scheduling shift way early, like at 5,300 RPM? What kind of transmission is it a NAG one? I guess well, I've already forgotten what what you had going earlier. Um, if you're commanding the shift at fifty three hundred and it's not shifting, it could be that it is hit, potentially hitting a torque uh, torque limiter. It's seeing too much torque, actual torque versus expected. Could potentially cause that you need to log high and uh and or, or slow and fast path as well as pedal and find out why it's not shifting uh you'll find that if it's i'm trying to think of what when we've had issues with this It's kind of rare to have that issue, but I've heard of that issue coming up in trucks with a lot of power. And I cannot remember exactly what the fix was aside from, I mean, usually the issue that we end up having is that they shift too early. And that is predictive shift freaking out because the acceleration factor is too quick, basically for what it's been programmed to work with. A lot of times raising uh, max RPM levels will fix that. Um, do this, check to see if you drop that ship, the, the, your ship point to 4,500, if it fixes, if it tries to fix the problem. But in many cases, it's typically something else going on in the tune, and I cannot remember exactly what was causing that one to... God, it's been forever ago since we ran into that. What the hell was the thing with that? Anyway, it'll, it may come to me later on. We That's one that we get with trucks, though, on, on very rare occasions. Oh, dad's saying that's a good price for today's market. It is. It is. I just don't want to see you get burned later on with it. Um, oh, Dr. Diff saying, yeah, it's definitely got a safety turned on. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Watch for shift ID in your scanner and see where the table is looking at. Would be your high and low slope. Uh, Clay's asking, do you think using 87 octane in a Hellcat is a good idea? If you're on, if you're at like 20,000 feet elevation, it may not matter. Uh, Dr. Joe's saying safety on is, I think, for two to one downshift. Shift ID equals nine when in track mode. Just saying his car came back with a spider infestation. That would suck.
Oh, Doc's hanging out with, uh, with those guys, getting them squared away. Let's see. We're saying, uh, does using a pedal commander hurt my Hellcat or supercharger in any way since I no longer have a decoupler pulley? No, pedal commander does not hurt anything with that. Doc saying, I love trans tuning, my favorite. How do you want the shift to feel? Very true. Oh, uh, yeah, Forshaken couldn't come down for, uh, for the, for Mopar Fest, I think is what he's saying. Um, oh, Craig's saying, any recommendation of tuners in Orlando area? Just trying to see if anyone knows anyone. Not off the top of my head, man. Oh, Clay saying 2021 Dodge Challenger SXT, a great entry way to get into a Dodge Challenger. Uh, yeah, some guys like the V6 cars. They're they're big into them. I know all the um, the uh, the aesthetic mod guys like them. Um. Doc said, Pedal Commander, just get a nine drive off eBay for 80 to 100 bucks. I guess. Pedal Commander, Pedal Box, Pedal Tickler. Some of them, the, the cool thing is Pedal Box, I think, will Bluetooth to your phone and you can just kind of, through your app, play with it. Uh, they're all pretty good and it's just a signal intercept. And I don't know. I like them. I think they're they're neat, and I'm surprised that they that the cars don't come from the factory with an option like that. It just it would seem like it would walk hand in hand with all the other gadgets and gizmos that they have. weird for a second saying i uh, he installed a z automotive bypass today because he's having intermittent issues with the hp tuner smart cable where pids will randomly disappear curious what cable you recommend for 18 plus mopars um i mean most guys are using the mpvi2 actually it's mpvi2 plus is what they're making so that would be what i would recommend for them Uh, you can Clay saying you can take an XST Challenger and put some turbos on a V6 engine. You you could, you absolutely could. And for a show car, that might be kind of neat, uh, provided you can see the turbos. You know, visual pop and all. We're saying, I feel like for the money I've put in a V6, if you wanted to make it more powerful, you could just get a Scat Pack. Well, that's true. Some guys have gotten into the V6 scene, and like I say, most of those guys are guys that um, are really more into the aesthetic. They'll, they'll do the bags and all that other kind of good stuff. The motor's just there to kind of move it around, and they'll put like superchargers on them and, and uh, things like that, just because it's you know visually kind of cool to see that kind of stuff, and it adds to the story, but definitely not for power. Oh, Doc saying he had the same problem with the security module. That's why I never got off the MPVI-1. And Riff saying he's got his pedal commander used for a little bit of money, and it does hook to the phone. Nice. So you can just change it on the fly. Uh, Four Shaking saying, where's the Lone Star Mopar Fest going to be next year? Probably Dallas. And guys, we are coming up on two hours. I gotta go try to wash this stuff out of my eyeballs because they are still burning like crazy. Um, yeah, so I don't recommend using a spray-on <laughs> sunscreen that's industrial strength. But with that, guys, I wanna thank each and every one of y'all for hanging out. Could not, would not do this without you. Gonna send it, don't bend it, keep your shiny side up. And with that, we are wrapping it for the night and get this stuff out of my eyeballs. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it, Dads. Appreciate the uh, 
the contribution dad's garage and both of them and again y'all have a great one we'll catch you on the next one that's a wrap adios